Afternoon, everyone. Um, it's the first panel of the afternoon and the last one before lunch, so we will try to take you into lunch with a huge dose of inspiration, hopefully. We've got 45 minutes to talk about the work of transition, so you speak quickly, OK? <laughs> <laughs> It's easy, 45 minutes is fine. Um, I have written and rewritten and rewritten my introduction several times this morning already because so much of what has been said is so vibrantly in the space of what we're going to discuss today. Uh, so hopefully something will come out of my mouth that makes sense to you. Uh, my name is Susie. I am a producer, otherwise known as an alchemist, um, although I often feel like I am not doing alchemy. Let it be said. Um, I move ideas around between people uh, and into spaces where those ideas need to take shape and flourish in order for us to do transitional work. I started in the cultural sector in funding. I have returned a couple of times since and always left desperately frustrated. Uh, and that might be something that comes up, the kind of movement, I think, between different types of work and how we occupy spaces temporarily and then move into a different way of being. Um, these guys sitting with me are extraordinary. I have a dream team, lucky me. I will let them introduce themselves because they know themselves much, much better than I do, obviously, I hope. Um, uh, and I wanted to pick up on a couple of things that were said earlier on. We're kind of a sister panel to panel one. So, you know, in that panel, I was furiously writing notes. Um, what came up in there for me was a lot of talk about experimentation and creativity and imagination, of course, imagination. And that imagination thing is so important because Essentially, we're talking about getting to the future, and we talk about the future as this destination, but it's not a destination, is it? It's a process. It's a, a movement towards something that we all hold in our imaginations and is no one singular thing. It's multiples that layer onto each other, depending on who we are, what our experience has been, whether we've had breakfast. Uh, and part of the work that we're doing in this transition space, I think, is about juggling those imaginations and eking them out and bringing them into the present, bringing that vision of the future into the present. Uh, it's really layered. Uh, it's really multiple. It's, there's a lot of pluralism in there, which is where we'll focus over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, and these guys here, they are in the, the, the fabric of their work is in that space of experimenting and creating. What they're doing the whole time is designing, developing, implementing, building. They're also simultaneously listening sense-making, stewarding, hosting, supporting some of the healing that needs to happen. Uh, and often, the space that they're in is very difficult to see. It's urged towards the, the intangible. It's often invisible. It's about connection. It's about relationship building. It's not singular projects that come into the world with a start and an end that can be neatly measured and then left behind. That's not, that's not how transition works, which I think is something we all know. But we don't necessarily have the funding systems and the investment systems in place to support that. Um, I wanted to say something about practice, because it strikes me that these guys are all in practice, they're all in process, and they are also practicing. So everything we do in our work is about trying. We're trialing stuff. We're seeing what happens when we make something happen, what happens next. Uh, we don't necessarily know it's going to work. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, and we're constantly learning from that. I think learning may come up a little bit as well as we talk through this. Uh, the work that happens in this space of transition is never work that happens in isolation. It relies on the village, it relies on the collective, it relies on a network. We're all sitting on each other's shoulders, we're all feeding each other the whole time. And that's kind of where I want to start with you, is in that layered, interdependent, interdisciplinary system that we all occupy. I'm going to go to each of you and ask you to talk a little bit about where that, talk about yourself, your work, and a little bit about where and how that layering appears. Ali, can I start with you? I drew the sort of, I had the short straw. <laughs> and the short straw was given to me. I didn't even take it up. Uh, so uh, just a little bit about myself before I sort of dive into the topic that we're talking about in this session and sort of, you know, I got some of the understandings of what you in the room have heard from the last session, but forgive me, I was walking up, so I didn't have all of that. In terms of personal, uh, I was born and raised in Iran. I came to the UK when I was 15 sort of asylum process, home office, 13 years, lots of fun, pre-Priti Patel, but largely the same story. 
And in terms of my sort of experiences in different sort of sectors or spaces that we have been in, I have been in and out of charity sector, in and out of for-profit companies, and also the trade union movement. And now, sort of, the day job, the wage labor, is JRCT and Lancaster Chase. So that's the sort of, that's what I'm doing to sustain the mortgage. Mm. That's one side of it. But I think the other side of it that I wanted to talk about was sort of the backgrounds of, personal backgrounds of Iran, different movements, different types of businesses that are coming. And I think one of the things that I wanted to talk about was sort of movements for and against. And in this moments of transition, and I think we are living through a more acute version of it in the last few years, sort of post 2008 globally, but also post pandemic and reimagining what life is, what work is, what family is, what connection is, what makes us happy, what really, really, really annoys us <laughs> <laughs> about sort of the situation we live in. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's sort of where I have been and I sort of, what I wanted to share was a little bit about where the role of movements are mm -hmm. in the space that we exist now. And I think sort of the session before us talked a little bit about imagination and my reading, my understanding of my country's history, but also coming here to the UK is that those sort of imaginary outcomes, different versions of it, are emerging a lot of times, not from a room like this, but the margins that are not seen and then surprise us. Mm -hmm. And it is how we react to those visions and to those movements and spaces. And I think the other side of it to say is that this is, this is long-term work. This is work that is interconnected. We all talk about it, but sometimes in the pressure of day-to-day -day and the world as is, we fall into the silos. And the final thing that I would say is that sort of, before wrapping up, because I don't want to take lots of time because we want to get to the chat first, probably, is that I think I'm sort of looking at the plurality of transitions. There are transitions that are already happening and are conflicting visions of what the world is going to become and what plans are for that and different spaces. So we have to, in those multitude of visions, own the visions that we want to share and we want to share with each other and the outcomes that we want to share because we are not the actors only in that space, yeah. the multitude of actors. And I heard sort of somebody talked about nation states in the session before and I was like, woo, nation states. So yeah, we'll come back to that. <laughs> it's a threat. Um, <laughs> Farah. Um, so I'm Farah. Um, I currently work at the Greater London Authority for the next two weeks. Um, and um, I've got loads of my kind of system partners in the room here from London as well. It's a real privilege to be able to work um, in and for London. I think someone earlier talked about kind of really loving their Mexico City. I really love London and Londoners, um, and it's a really great place to be able to work. Um, and I think Jane earlier spoke about um, kind of funding the, the outside edge of innovation and finding people that are working at that outside edge of innovation. And I think some of the work that we do is on the opposite edge um, is actually kind of where um, it, it starts from a, a belief in the kind of deep magic that exists within communities, within London, within different parts of the city, um, but that actually for, for structural reasons, for um, resourcing reasons, um, that potential and that magic that exists isn't, doesn't always get realized. It doesn't, it's not always seen. It's not always able to reach its potential. And so um, for us as a GLA, for, for as a regional body and fellow funders, City Bridge Trust, Trust for London, National Lottery, what is our role in kind of creating the right scaffolding um, and the right conditions and the right relationships um, in order to realize that potential? Um, I guess I get really worried about that outside edge because I think the current system that we live in means that the people that we recognize as at being on that outside edge are often the ones that have been able to code what they're doing in a way that the current system recognizes. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're talking about transitions and I, I'm, I guess a lot of our work is more kind of 
thinking about where the current sector is, where communities are, where are their gaps, and kind of moving to that space and trying to move resource into that space, create spaciousness for them to step away from the treadmill to really think about um, you know, what, what's kind of emerging from inside their hearts um, and give them kind of the, the kind of imagination, infrastructure, luxury of space, or, or all of these things that so many of the communities we work with talk about how they, they only ever get funded to look at the tip of the iceberg. And so um, one of the funds we have, the Civil Society Roots Fund, is just about trying to create space for them to move down that iceberg and that spaciousness to actually just think and reflect on, on what's, going, what's going on for them. Um, and I guess just a, a short point that maybe we can come back to later. Like I really, really deeply feel that the, the, the things that you're getting called to externally to solve are the same problems that you need to solve internally, both at an individual level, but also at an organizational level. So actually a lot of my work is about how we transform the GLA and how the GLA moves to being the kind of organization that it needs to be. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there because I want to be like, these are all my heroes. So I'm really excited to be in conversation with all these baddies. So, yeah. I've got like boxes with words in them that I'll look back at <laughs> and I'll be like, right. No. Uh, <laughs> great. Uh, OK, Alistair, let's move to you. And then we'll try and pull, once all four of you have spoken, we'll pull this into conversation. Cool. Fab. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Alistair. I'm the co-founder. I'm a designer. Uh, I'm the co-founder of uh, uh, an organisation called uh, Open Systems Lab, and we're a kind of non-profit R&D company working on systems, which is a slightly weird thing to be. Um, I don't advise it at all. No, I do. Um, the, I, I mean, to start with the bit we all know, right, which is, uh, you know, it's very, very evident we're being hit by a, a kind of wave, a successive wave of crises that are tearing off the wallpaper. And as you were touching, uh, oh, touching on earlier was, uh, it's all fine, nothing's breaking. Um, you know, a, a systemic wave of crises that are sort of hitting us and exposing kind of stuff's breaking, basically, right? And actually, what's really interesting is that um, kind of, if, if, if you speak to individuals who are at basically maybe at one end, the kind of front face, the kind of front line of these systems, um, or the front line of these, of these crises, who are trying to do something good, they're finding themselves feeling incredibly powerless. They feel a bit like they're kind of fighting an inferno with a water pistol. Um, and they will say to you, ah, look, yeah, it's systemic, it's structural. Um, and, and that's both true for, for those who are kind of on one side, and then those on the other side who say, well, look, there's not a lot I can do about this because of the system of incentives around me. You know, I've got a mortgage, I've got rent to pay, whatever it is, right? So we're trapped into these things. And so we seem to increasingly have no problem in people will recognize, you know, the people who are actually at the front line of fighting these day-to-day -day issues will say, oh, it's systemic, it's structural. And so what do we mean by that? So you kind of, what, it, what I think they mean, which you were getting at, which is like if you pull a, start pulling a string, right, and going, well, what's driving on this? Well, actually, I'm hitting up against the way we do things. And, and you pull the string and you realize it's connected to other, lots of other strings. And so politics tends to give us these very, very simplistic narratives about what the solutions are and who's to blame. Except when you, live, when you sit with an issue for any period of time and you pull those strings, you realize it's in, incredibly intricate and complex and everything's connected to everything else. And at that point, there's this temptation to kind of ah, give up, right? Uh, but actually, th there's another thing, which is when you encounter, what you begin to encounter, that, that these underlying... This, this stack of systems which we use every day that are completely invisible to us, like uh, ways of doing. So our procurement systems, our planning systems, our construction systems, our knowledge systems, right? And those systems were designed and a lot of them were designed a very long time ago, right? They were designed in the 19th century. You know, our knowledge systems were designed in the sort of 18th century. Our land system, our kind of highly feudal colonialist land system, was basically designed in the 11th century. And it hasn't really been, it's been kind of tweaked since, but we haven't really changed it, right? So we're kind of, I would sometimes describe it, it's a bit like running out of date operating systems as a, as a society. And, we're, and it's really hard to, to, A, see them, because to even see them, as a, you know, it's not like, is there the elephant in the room? They are the room, mm -hmm. right? We are inside the elephant, <laughs> all right? So it's really hard to kind of, it's, to see these structures, nice. and yet they're deeply practical. Like, we use them every day, right? 
They're, they're how we procure, they're how you offer grants or whatever, whatever it is, right? Um, and, and, and they're breaking, right? They're obsolete because they were designed for a world which had different challenges, different values, uh, uh, and, and, and different technologies, right, at a blunt level. Like a lot of them, you know, we're, one of our projects is looking at how we can transform the planning system. The planning system was designed before computers or the internet. It was designed for a world that ran on, whose operating system was paper and knowledge was in the head of experts. So um, this raises this question of, wait a minute, whose job is it to redesign these systems? And everyone's like, oh. And everyone points at someone else, right? The state thinks it's the market's job, and the market thinks it's the state's job. And so it's kind of falling down the sofa of history. Now, the optimistic bit of this is that when you look back through history and you look at where did the social systems that we use every day come from, the working week, the alphabet, right, the, the World Wide Web, uh, you know, all the, all the, the, the like standard railway gauges, all these sorts of things that we use every, every day, they, most of them w didn't come from the market or the state. There's a really good book by James Plunkett, which you might be aware of, called End State, where he talks about some of the histories, of, some of my favorite histories of where open systems that we all, common systems that we all use came from. Most of them didn't come from the market or the state. They came from citizens, from people who were close to the problem. Some of them were in, in state institutions or in, in businesses. Um, but they kind of said, no, wait a minute. What if we were to design a new one from within within the existing system. Um, so in blunt terms, that's our job, right? That's your, we, we, like, nobody is funding those, despite the fact that we all agree it's the thing that we need to do is to redesign our systems based on the values and the technologies and the challenges that we have today. So in a really, really, a really simplistic level, and I, I'm not in you know, the philanthropic sector, that's kind of what, you know, like, that's kind, of the, that's kind of the challenge, right? Is to work out whose job is it, right? It's no one's, but it's what, it, it's, it's what needs doing. So the next thing that spins out is how. Now, part of that, I'm hoping you guys I mean, have heard some amazing stuff today, kind of un understand better than, than me, and you know, maybe we can talk about some of those things. But part of then is also on our side, which is working out what type of organization we should be, what type of thing, and how do we organize? Um, how do we... Uh, um, you know, and we're sort of, again, we can talk about this, but we won't go into it now, but, you know, we're sort of developing a playbook of tactics of how do you understand the system, come up with a thing that works, that, you know, that, what we call the Trojan horse, something that is useful right now, that embodies the principles of the future system, but is actually useful to somebody in the existing system right now. Uh, how do we make it last? How do we make it survive over the sort of 10-year time light horizon until the old system dies and this one has got to be ready. It's our job to make sure that the new system is ready, has a community around it, and is kind of ready to step up. So, so how do, we've got to pr move pretty quickly now to work out what that playbook, what that set of tactics look like. And, and, and there's a certain urgency, right, to, to do it, because otherwise we're just going to go end off going off the cliff trying to do good in a bad bus. And while that needs to happen with obviously lots of inputs from lots of different layers, you're sitting specifically in that systems design space, aren't you? I mean, I mean specifically what the system design space is a tricky... Yeah. Um, we'll talk about that later. Approach right. him at lunchtime and ask him what yeah. that is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, Fazana. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm also um, surrounded by people I have so much respect for, so it's a great honour to be here. Um, my background is in youth and community organising um, and building. I am the exec at Healing Justice London, which works on the intersections of uh, personal and structural transformation and how we create capacity for transformation, the conditions and capacities to be able to transform. Um, and we do that through the lens of healing and health justice. Um, I also am here, I guess, in the capacity, no, I guess, I am also here in the capacity of resourcing racial justice, um, which it was an emergency fund that um, we built um, at the you know, beginning of the pandemic, particularly to res resource uh, racialized communities in a country where it's not charitable to, to do racial justice work, where actually it's, our infrastructure is designed that money doesn't flow to some of the most strategically marginalized communities. And that's intentional and that's designed and engineered and sustained. It's sustained by its current structure and it's sustained by um, 
philanthropic capitalism because that's where we're situated. So I also wanted to bring that in as because it's some of the things that have definitely informed not only the position and site from which I'm speaking, but also how um, healing justice has been approaching a lot of its work. One of the things that I do want to kind of start from or um, where I want to locate myself is I've been, despite how crushing our times are, I still find myself very hopeful. And I do see myself in that we're in the portal that Arundhati Roy talked about the pandemic as a portal, but that these moments of, of um, opportunity, and if not now, when? Like we've got nothing to lose. Like we literally have nothing to lose. Um, and I was interrogating that for myself. Like why, am I idealistic? And I actually realized I'm not idealistic, I'm realistic. I have evidence. And the reason that I say I have evidence is that Che Guevara, talked about revolution, and there's a reason why I'm bringing revolution into this room, um, as the turning of the heart. Um, and it, he was a physician. A lot of people don't know that he was a physician. He was in the medical field. And he saw a lot of patients who had the will to die and come back to life, who were literally on their deathbed and found ways to resuscitate their own hearts. And so he talks about this turning of the heart, the willing of the unimaginable into existence. And this is the moment in time that we are all in, where we've got to be willing the unimaginable into existence. That's what we are tasked with. And I have evidence of that. I've seen that in our community organizing. I've seen that in my family from hospital beds and deathbeds to life. I've seen it in some of the most marginalized um, uh, sites that possibility exists and in such powerful and resilient and capacious ways. But I also ask myself, what would that look like if it was resourced, mm -hmm. if we were not traumatized, if we had more capacity, if we had stronger and more robust resilience? And then how does those with all the capital, all the assets, all the power and the money move in the direction to resource that? How do we mobilize what we've got, the 80 billion in the UK, and we're only moving 5%? towards the direction of collective liberation and transformation. And so when I bring in revolution into the room, it's not enough to say radical right now. Like it's not, if you are comfortable today, it means you are being protected by particular um, markers of privilege. Um, if you are feeling safe, if you feel like you're well, it, it, it's not possible to be well given the different unsustainable power structures that are collapsing because they are in, in themselves inherently unsustainable. So what we are tasked with is how do we move towards that total overhaul, the bringing into existence, the willing of the unimaginable into existence, which others are already doing, those on the margins are already doing, as part of our work. How, what is the role of philanthropy beyond you know, proximity to movements or just moving a tiny amount into movement spaces to radically bring about those realities? And how does it do it in a sustained way? How does it invest in the leadership, the innovation, the risk-taking of those in our communities that are already doing that work? And how does it do it from a reparative justice lens? Often when we talk about reparations, we're talking about it as colonialism or an, um, transatlantic enslavement as a historical ill that we're trying to repair from. But what effective reparative justice does, accountability does, is it looks backwards but also projects and puts forwards the dismantling of conditions so the harms that took place can never exist again. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that we need to be working with. So really it's a call to action about where philanthropy is sitting, how it revolutionizes itself and not on just a foundation level, but also all of us within it, because we all have a role to, to play. What are the skills we're building so we can discern what actions to take? Where do we sit in the ecosystem of change? How do we know our positionality and the privileges that we hold? And how do we build that structural capacity where the most effective work is happening so it can be sustained and it can take risks and it can make mistakes? Mm -hmm. Because that's the other thing. Our communities, those of us that are people of color um, who have been marginalized, when we iterate, and we grow and we learn, we do not get the same redemption that white men do, like Boris Johnson. And so 
we really need to create the capaciousness to invest in the visions and strategies and capacity to learn and iterate of the leadership that's already within us. Um, I'm going to park here, but yeah. It's a good place to park. <laughs> okay, um, I want to pick up on... Fazana asked a question in that. She said, what would it look like... What, I'm putting my book down. What would it, <laughs> what would it look like? Um, it's getting real. Yeah. <laughs> Shit's got what real. What would it look like if, if some of these things, some of these people, some of these movements ultimately were well funded, if they, were, were, if they had enough to support the resilience building, the healing, the resilience building, the futuring work that they are doing through the power of their own heart resuscitations? What would it look like? What would it look like? Can we pick up on some of what the work that we're actually resourcing a couple of you, or building a couple of you, and, and describe that work for the people in the room. I'm happy to Go for it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I've seen it fully yet. I think um, there's, there's so much that needs to be untangled. There's so much trust that needs to be built. There's so much kind of, so many relationships that need to be established. Like, so in our Civil Society Roots Fund, for example, what, in this round of funding, we're focusing on 10 boroughs that historically marginalized groups receive less funding in. The pre-work before the funding even opened to actually convince people that we're actually serious about wanting to fund them, that these are the outer London boroughs, not the inner London boroughs, which are used to receiving lots of funding. Um, that we don't want them to tell us the service they're going to provide, that we want them to think about um, what they need as an organization to work more systemically, to work better in partnership. Like, just the amount of work we had to do to even just convince people that we're genuine about that was quite significant. I think it's, there's, you know, I think someone earlier was talking on the investment side that it's not just like where you're getting gain from, but actually a lot of funding practice um, causes so much harm in terms of communities' capacities to imagine and to do things differently and to take risks. And so I think there's some really, there's loads of work that needs to be done um, in terms of how we fund and who we fund and, and the relationships that we build. But where I've seen it work most effectively is like where me and my colleagues and my team have been in deep relationships with those communities and have reiterated again and again and again that we trust you, we want you to take risks. That's really exciting. How can we share that? Um, it's okay that you've, you're completely pivoting. Like all of those things, like even for really established organizations, so not just like nascent ones, they, that belief just like convincing that there's such a trust gap between funders and, and those communities that actually is, stands in the way of people being able to kind of be audacious unless they're, you know, the exceptions or they're, they're you know, um, but yeah, so it, those are some of the things that we're thinking about. But I don't think we've got it right. I want to just notice there that um, Faria talked about reiterating, and she means reiterating points with people. But we also had earlier, I think it was you, Fazana, talking about iterating in the agile sense of the word. So experimenting and trying and testing again. And this, for me, is a really important word in all of this conversation about transition. It's the idea of iteration and letting things roll, testing it coming out, rolling again. It's not just, we will, it will never be right in the one time that we try. So I just wanted to pick up on that. Does anyone want to, yeah, Ali, you want to pick up on Forrest? So just to bring it back to the sort of systems, there's a part of me that goes, yes, the systems are failing or we can see them as breaking. But there's a part of me that sees the systems as working fabulously well, better than they have ever done at any rate in recorded history until we go past to the kingdoms where power was so concentrated. That's, that's one side of it. And I think the other side of it is like, there's a part of me that wants to bring some realism into this stuff. We are not going over the cliff. Certain communities, certain countries, certain people are over the cliff. Mm -hmm. My hometown, the river that goes through it gave birth to early civilizations of Mesopotamia. That river is dying. This is not climate change will come in eight to 10 years. This is certain communities are screwed and that's happened right now. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to recognize our positionality of like, yeah. yes, the macro picture is eight to 10 years, but the micro picture across the world is very, very different. And we are having a good time of it in UK. I think the other side of it that I would say, sort of going back to Faris, is like, what we have been able to do in JRCT 
is to build, start building some of those trusting relationships and it has taken a while because the practice is old and 100 years of certain communities, certain types of organizations, certain interpretations. An organization that comes and says we are anti-capitalist, would that get funded 10 years ago? Would that get funded 20 years ago? An organization that comes and says we are abolitionist, those frameworks have been moved to the margins. It wasn't that sort of, you know, and we need to repair those relationships. And I would add one more thing, and we are not going to be the center of that liberation mm. because that liberation will not be funded. That liberation will come from below, yes. will come from hundreds of thousands of people putting hundreds of thousands and millions of hours, time and money in order to build their individual community, their individual home, the individual institutions that have been decayed from the top, yeah. but needs to be rebuilt from the below. So then what is the job? If we're talking about movements, yeah. what is the job of the funder there then? We can at best catalyze conditions okay. and build some of the infrastructure that Farah was talking about of some of these spaces and de-risking what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So they are not putting their whole life on the line to pursue a vision. Okay, can we, can we describe that? I, I mean, you're going to hate me for this. These guys are never going to talk to me again. No, no, no. But, but like, <laughs> if, if as an institution we go charitability, what does that mean? We go, well, for my sins, I worked on Charities Act Review 2011. Mm -hmm. This means that we are looking at 2011 Charities Act Review, what Lord Hodgson at the time viewed as charitable, and going, that's the good that society needs. Mm -hmm. And that means from the funder position, we have to challenge what that good is. If we want tax deductions to be going towards those causes, we have to redefine the terms of charity and terms of movements and justice. And those are, might end up being two different terms. In an ideal world, they are the same. But that means you know, being using the positions and power that we have in these institutions to push against the systems, the regulations, the procurements. So it's kind of kaleidoscopic. What you're describing is kaleidoscopic. Kaleidoscopic, and Jane alluded to it as well. It's not just the funding. It's not just getting the money out into the sector. It's also the advocacy and the lob sometimes lobbying. Those of you who are allowed show to show up on a picket line. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> show up on a picket um, line. If yeah. we are talking about advocacy for working class people, Houston's not that far. Yeah. Twenty seventh, there would be a picket. We are talking about assets that have grown over the pandemic and wages that haven't. Yeah. So institutionally, we have choices to make and our inaction is choices as well. Where we don't turn up is choices. Yeah. And to pick up on Ali's point, I think that there is, there is a, and we saw this with, um, uh, during the uprisings, um, with Black Lives Matter, you know, funders were, were ready to, to, to hashtag Black Lives Matter, but, you know, then it dwindles down what, what's sexy for a moment and then what isn't. And I think what we see in philanthropy more and more is the DEI, you know, having proximity to movements, having, you know, the language, the woke literacy of movements, but actually that integrity, the presence of seeing itself situated in the ecosystem of change we're not seeing that. And that is also a, a conceptual shift because philanthropy often sees itself as inherently benevolent yeah. and it hasn't made fully its shift, that it has reparative work to do that is inherently also maintaining and um, growing inequity. It's growing forms of injustices. And so what does it mean for philanthropy to even exist? Um, and what, what is a justice vision where actually we have economic model, models where philanthropy in and of itself doesn't exist. None of the jobs here, including mine, doesn't exist. That's the world that we're moving towards, right? And then I think right now in the interim, as we work towards that, that vision, what are the things that philanthropy has to do? And a key part of our learning from resourcing racial justice was how do we return the risk and responsibility to philanthropy? It took two women of color to, f 
to financially be liable for one million pounds, like it was on mine and my colleague Nusrat's name, to be able to take some of the risks that other philanthropic bodies should have done, mm -hmm. and the challenges to the Charities Commission, the dismantling of the infrastructure of how money flows in this country, what it means to hold assets, what it means to strategically divest from things and, and invest towards um, that structural capacity, that work needs to be militantly held. That risk and responsibility needs to be held by philanthropy in a very urgent way. Um, and so I think if there's practical ways that it can organize, it needs to really be tasked with that. You can't look to us to keep carrying that burden. You have to become skillful and, and in that work mm. because we're getting sick, our people are dying. You like literally in practical terms, and we need you to be able to show up in appropriate ways and not be hand holding all the time. It's just, it's just non negotiable right now. We need to think about the strategic investment in communities um, and through the protection of actual access to assets. Like we're still begging for two to three years funding when we need large scale funding. Um, the right wing are so organized in might, in military, in money. And we're still, you know, like with beggars bowls. We need long term sustained funding. We need access to buildings and lands that we can redistribute and um, communi communicate hold and also have space and time to figure that out mm -hmm. and then also to invest in our trauma and healing so that we're not rupturing because mm -hmm. of the competitiveness that mm -hmm. philanthropy has embedded in our communities to be able to have the capacity to be present without feeling violence all the time so there's all of these strategic sites that we can be doing and um, that isn't gonna just come from us but that pathway finding the solution finding has to come and and we're, we're pointing to it. We're saying long-term funding, strategic funding, unifying strategies, investment, and also divestment. There are certain things we're funding that just are old, mainstream, outdated models and actually taking risks with us. Um, and I also think that there's a really key part of, um, I'm going to actually part because I see this five minutes to go and I would love to hear from others. Okay. I, I actually just want to pick you up on that. Maybe we can, Alistair, maybe you can come into this a little bit. Fazana, what does it look like when the, when, the, when the work is funded more longitudinally? Describe what, what it looks, what can you do? So, I mean, we can do so much more, but I also want to say Healing Justice um, was awarded a 10-year award. It barely just covers our you know, core costs. Um, and now it's also become a bit more precarious because of changes. But I had to send an email to our funders saying, hey, cost of living is going up. That means everyone's salary doesn't match being, afford being able to afford life. Another thing that happens is we're a majority lived experience team. What that means is we can only hire senior junior roles. Mm -hmm. The amount of money, so that means the expertise and mm -hmm. years of experience. We can't afford to really take risk to grow and power within our communities because even if you get it, it's not enough because as we're building, we need more infrastructure, more capacity in a way that is so disproportionate from what large stream, you know, what what essentially our presses have, what mainstream infrastructure has. So I really want to hold that sometimes if, if both those things aren't happening, which is the active work of dismantling, but actually assessing what it takes to do the work. Like we think that anti-racist work or anti-oppression work is this neatly packaged solution. It's not, it's so much rigorous uh, love and labor and a lot of um, internal transformation and external transformation that is, it doesn't have identifiable solutions. Okay, so what I hear when Fazana talks, this is where I want you to come in, Alistair. What I hear when Fazana talks is that Fazana is holding so much responsibility. She is flag bearing, she's designing and producing, she's also stewarding and shepherding people with care and love. But the, 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 the simultaneity of all of this is so difficult to hold, it's exhausting, isn't it? And here we have someone who is working on infrastructuring, systems design, and I, like to me it feels like the collaboration potential here is massive, and we don't know how to support it, right? So the, the help, the help, help is a loaded um, term. 
Can I just query that? I think we're already designing our radical yeah. me methodologies and approaches, and we need to do that on our terms. You do. Yeah, so I'm not suggesting you don't do that. That's the thing that I, as, and you know I admire your work so much, but actually it needs to be self-determined by our communities. Yeah, yeah, so for clarity, I don't think that that should ever be taken away from community. But I do think there's a job here in, in describing and in supporting the flow of the assets and the resources around that perhaps something something that, that, that people like you and actually across the across yeah, the panel yeah. can help with, right? Yeah, I mean, there's that, I think it was Keynes' this kind of famous saying about the problem is not so much embracing uh, into the new ideas, it's escaping the old ones. Yeah. Right, so th the very idea of going, hold on a minute, why can't we redesign this system or this structure? That begins with having the ability to step back out of the work, right? And that's why traditionally, it's gen generally privileged people who get the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because you get to have the time. The, the, the benefits can, can be orders of magnitude, right? You know, there's a famous example of, I think, the thing about the... Um, the several point triage system for heart attacks was a doctor working in ER got us an, just enough funding to be able to step back from the front line of ER for just long enough to write this paper that transformed our ability to tell when people were going to have a heart attack before they had a heart attack, right? So it, whatever the domain, whatever the field is, you need to cover, you need, basically it's stipending, right? Mm -hmm. You need to give people the space and time. Then the next thing is, is, uh, to understand the system and to realize you've never finished understanding the system because you only work, learn by doing stuff and making it and then working out you've done it wrong and et cetera, et cetera. And this, in a way, is kind of the pushback to whilst it's absolutely right that we should be kind of going to these kind of big, we, you know, pushing back against the incumbent interests, right? But at the same time, certainly one of our experience has been that when you really get into the weeds of one of these systems, you find there aren't actually that many properly bad guys. Yeah. Everybody thinks they're the good guy. Everybody's individual mm. behavior is individually understandable, but collectively catastrophic. The way I, I mean, we're doing work on redesigning new forms of property, which is a really weird thing to work on, right? Uh, pulling on all the amazing work that so many people and, and Mara and so many people do. And, but the, uh, like, the, there's, there's the kind of the strange thing about like trying to do that is I, I use the analogy of it's imagine trying to redesign the game of Monopoly while you're still on the board. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, was it Kimberly Jones during the Black Lives Matter? She gave that amazing speech about this. Um, the, the, imagine trying to redesign the game. So even if every single player in the game of Monopoly completely disagrees with the game of Monopoly, they've got a family to feed, they, you know, they're worried about their own security, right? So what we've got to somehow try and do is, is find the principles of, of a system as it could be. And one of, the, one of our things in our playbook is this idea of identify six or seven core principles that almost nobody can disagree with from any political spectrum, right? And so in an ideal world, if we were to step out of the game, this is the world we would like to be in. And then build a version of that world and invite everybody to come over to it. Well, I call it sometimes called the lifeboat strategy. And again, I think Graham mm. and people like that theorize this much better. But the, like, you, you kind of invite people in uh, and st start trying to build that version. And you're, again, you're constantly iterating. Now, the interesting takeaway from this thing is if you look across at like Silicon Valley, the private sector has kind of worked out how to do this. They have this whole infrastructure of incubators and stuff. So if you are a young person with a big idea, honestly, there were times in our life where we couldn't move. For every time I'd go anywhere and speak, there'd be some investor who'd tell us, take my money. I'd say, nope, it's not for sale, pal. Yeah. We're not going to work for shareholders. We're working for everybody. So um, th th there's, they've got this framework. They've got a whole kind of ladder of investment that you kind of go through. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a way of using, for example, the amazing power of the web. And what have they used it? They've used it to create companies like Uber, which have managed to capture the thing. How? By making something slightly less difficult, for, like making it slightly more convenient. To co now, imagine if we brought the same kind of ingenuity to actually yeah. tackling these problems. And the good news is, the note of optimism is, everything that, that we've seen so far, we are definitely learning as we go. All of us are learning as we go. Um, but the, the, the thing I see so far is that there are loads of young people out there from all kinds of backgrounds who want to be doing this, are passionate about doing this because they see that everything's on fire. Um, and at the moment, they're just going to, they're having to go in these incubators and they're selling equity on day two. 
right? Because there's no other option. There is no channel for them to go to and say, actually, give me the space and time to think about this, to find a Trojan horse, to build an open source community around it and get it ready for when the system collapses. And on that note, <laughs> very many minutes late, I'm going to wrap us up. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies, team. Um, thank you all, uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Um, that was brilliant and um, just so important, I think, to keep on reflecting on the kind of work that needs to be funded as well as the, as the scale of change that's needed. So thinking not only about projects, but movements, narrative, hidden wiring. So um, thank you so much to the panel. Um, we are running uh, about eight minutes late, um, so I don't want to keep you from your food, but just to say we've got an hour for lunch now. It's upstairs in the Battle Bridge room. Um, so uh, go and enjoy yourselves, enjoy some sunshine on the terrace. Um, we're coming back this afternoon to get more into the questions kind of specifics about what does it take to finance this transition that we find ourselves in um, so um, we've got all sorts of great panels later on so I hope to see you later and um, if you aren't staying with us uh, for the afternoon I'd be really grateful if you could drop your lanyards back with the team up in the Battle Bridge room even if you're coming back tomorrow um, we'll have it there ready for you in the morning but thank you very much for being here and uh, enjoy your lunch